The tarnished jewel which nature placed in San Francisco Bay, known as Alcatraz, has been coveted and feared, admired and discarded by successive generations for more than 200 years. For it was in the summer of 1775 when the Spanish explorer Ayala first recorded the existence of a previously unknown island, calling it the Isle of the Pelican. For over 70 years it remained unexplored, content to wait jealously offshore, until one man had the thought that something should be done with it, a sentiment that would echo through the ages, from one culture to another. In 1846, Pio Pico, the last Mexican governor of California, granted title to Alcatraz to one Julian Workman, with the sole stipulation that Workman establish a much needed navigational light on the island. However, before he could act upon his claim, Commodore Drake Sloat landed 250 Marines at Monterey. Raising the American flag, he claimed California for the United States. The island of Alcatraz reluctantly fell into the hands of the federal government. In 1854, long before it would gain notoriety as the infamous Isle of No Return or America's Devil's Island, Alcatraz enjoyed the reputation of being the first lighthouse and military fortification on the West Coast. The island changed titles as often as it did government agencies that controlled it. For more than a half a century, it was ignored and then forgotten, while it assumed the tenuous role of a military prison, more out of convenience than necessity. There, conscientious objectors, deserters, and rebel Indian warriors lived out their lives, lost and forgotten by a world that has remembered only their successors some 50 years later. Soon, the newer walls of the prison barracks began to crumble, The fortification suitable for wartime activity of the 1860s had become obsolete. In 1906, at a cost of almost a quarter of a million dollars, prison labor gave birth to a new stronghold, the symbol of Alcatraz that the public would remember. As World War I loomed, the facilities were ominously renamed the U.S. Disciplinary Barracks. But the island of Alcatraz drifted into uselessness and decay for almost 20 years, until another federal agency saw in its cold, gray aloofness a new reason for existence. to the rampant lawlessness of the 30s, the most important experiment in the history of the United States penal system was ordered under the auspices of the federal government. Under the command of Warden James A. Johnston, Alcatraz Island was converted into America's first escape-proof prison. News of society or current events was not allowed in the prison. There were no trustees, there were no favors. There was only, as one inmate said, the exquisite torture of routine. And that's what Alcatraz was all about, routine. The glamour was left far behind in the movie theaters, surrendering only in reality to the monotony and desperation which was Alcatraz prison. In August of 1934, the island was ready. The federal civil prison on Alcatraz Island uh, was in a sense a, a noble experiment like the Volstead Act, Prohibition in the uh, 20s. 
Uh, nobody really wanted it. Most particularly, it wasn't wanted by the officials of the Bureau of Prisons. But Attorney General Cummings was 100% right, and the Bureau of Prisons officials were 100% wrong. They thought that Alcatraz, an institution of that type, was not needed in their prison system. Attorney General Cummings felt that it was, and he was right. It was needed. Mr. Cummings left, has come out to Alcatraz in the Golden Gate to see that all is ready for Al Capone and other new tenants from Atlanta. Mr. Warden, I congratulate you most sincerely upon the fine work that you have done here. I have every confidence in the manner in which you will manage this institution. It is, as you know, one of our pet projects and an essential part of the penal system of the federal government. It is a culmination, as it were, of a dream that our work of segregation might be carried on more scientifically and more completely than it ever has before. We look forward to great things from the use of Alcatraz prison. Mr. Attorney General, Alcatraz is ready. Alcatraz held to the concept of isolation and punishment, not rehabilitation. The rules and their obedience was the sole concern of the administration. Indeed, the rules imposed upon the inmates of Alcatraz fixed the most rigid routine of any American prison in this century. Given the most attention was the rule of silence. For the first three years of the prison's existence, an inmate was not permitted to speak unless absolutely necessary. Small talk meant solitary. Through 1940, the Alcatraz prisoner, unless he worked, spent 23 hours a day alone in his cell. The 24th hour was spent in the dining room for three 20-minute meals. The prisoner had five basic rights. He was guaranteed food, clothes, a cell, a shower once a week, and the right to see a doctor. He was not permitted privacy. Microphones hidden throughout the prison monitored any conversation. All the inmates' mail was censored. His letters were opened and read freely. Words were deleted and rearranged to prevent the usage of codes. Through a two-foot glass barrier, he was permitted to speak with one visitor a month, a blood relative or lawyer only. There was to be no talk of world news, sex, or prison life. Just behind the visiting area and outside the main cell house door was the armory. Encased in steel and bulletproof glass, the armory housed the prison's arsenal and served as the island's nerve center for communication to the mainland. This was the core, the nucleus of Alcatraz. Locked from the inside, manned 24 hours a day, the armorer controlled the movements of anyone entering or leaving the cell block. The Bureau of Prison officials all agreed. Escape from the island was impossible. The emerging reputation of Alcatraz seemed well deserved.